Hello, everybody. You are hearing me from on the internet because, uh, well, we're in summer session right now. Nobody's at the radio station. I'm Sam Stern, host of For the Record, and you are listening to WBRS Online. I am here with Chicago's guitarist, Keith Howland. How are you doing, Keith? I'm doing excellent. Thank you very much. So, you're currently on tour with the Doobie Brothers, if memory recalls. How's that going so far? Well, we just started up uh, the second leg of our tour. Um, we are in Chicago. We played last night, <clears throat> and uh, tonight we have a night off. But uh, it's going amazingly well. We're doing. Uh, ama- we're seeing amazing crowds. Uh, uh, this last leg of the tour, we did uh, Red Rocks and the LA Forum, and um, so things are things are going great. And uh, the Doobies are. An amazing band and um, both bands in my opinion are uh, playing as well or better than than ever right now the the current lineups of both groups is really really strong I mean we toured together I think four times since I've been with the band um, and this is definitely the strongest uh, both bands have been doing what do you think contributes to that particular strength? Well, there have been some personnel changes. <clears throat> um, the Doobies have, have gone uh, down to one drummer, um, and not that the, the double drummer thing wasn't a, wasn't a cool thing, but it really has kind of tightened up their, their sound a little bit. Um, Ed Toth is the drummer. He's a good friend of mine. He's, he's an amazing drummer. And, um, and they've also added... Um, Little Feet's uh, keyboard player Billy Payne to the lineup and Billy played on all the original recordings um, from the 70s that the Doobies you know recorded he was he was the piano player on all those records so you know having him in the band and going down to a single drummer is really um, really really made them real strong and on our front um, uh, the addition of Jeff Coffey on lead vocals and bass um, uh, has been a um, a real blessing. Um, he, he's an amazing tenor singer um, and a great bass player, and um, and also Alfredo Reyes Jr. Uh, on percussion has really, really um, added an element to the band on the percussion side that I don't think the band has seen since uh, Lagier de Oliveira was in the band in the seventies. You know, there was a, it, it was an element that was kind of missing from the live performance um, that, that is now returned. And you know, that, that the, those records from the seventies had lots of percussion on them. So I think that's uh, kind of the how and why of it, in my opinion. So, so, I mean, I've been interested in this for a while. How does Chicago's repertoire change on a tour-to-tour basis? You know what? I'm not even sure how to answer that because it it just sort of uh, organically changes. I mean, you know, obviously there are certain songs that we absolutely have to play every night. You can't not play Saturday in the park or does anybody really know what time it is or beginnings or 25 or six to four or make me smile or so there's kind of slots in the set where we can like rotate some other material in and out. Um, you know, in my time with the band, you know, there's, there's certain songs that we played and then not played, you know, stay the night, Baby, what a big surprise! Uh, Long comes a woman. Those are some that we're not doing right now that we have done in the past. Um, but now we're doing um, introduction in its entirety. Uh, Wake up sunshine, street player, which are songs that we haven't always done. So there's there's sort of the gold standards that are that are absolute requirements that people would be angry if they didn't hear and then there's some slots where we can kind of flip things in and out and i think 
I think once we get to the uh, once we get to the fall, um, there are going to be some changes made. We're going to throw in some tunes that we haven't done in a while. But um, what what is kind of cool though about this show we're doing with the Doobie Brothers is we are not shortening our show one bit. We're doing everything that we would do in a show if we were playing by ourselves. So you're getting a big chunk of the Doobie Brothers and then a full two plus hours, like two hours and 10 minutes of, of Chicago. So, um, that's kind of, uh, something that's a little bit different about this tour as opposed to, you know, you go see another quote unquote double bill where maybe each band might play 75 minutes, something like that. And then, be done. We're, we're, uh, we're giving you all you can handle. <laughs> that that's stunning. Actually, actually that answered my next two questions, whether the, okay. enti- whether the entire change was a whole, whether the change in repertoire as small as that may be is a whole band decision. Answer is an obvious yes. Yeah. I mean, sure. It's sort of a, um, and, and it's always a, trial and error kind of thing. It's like, okay, let's put this song in the set. Like for, for instance, uh, way back, I think in the early two thousands, um, we, we put a song in the set called a hit by Berez, which was the opening track off Chicago five. And it's a very kind of avant-garde piece. And I think we performed it three nights and it's on YouTube. You can find it, but you know, the audience reaction, the, the hardcore fans, which represent maybe, you know, 2% of our audience were going crazy over it. The rest of the crowd kind of just looked at us with a blank stare. Like what, what is that? I don't know that song. Um, can you please play Saturday in the park? (laughs) So we, so we pulled it out of the set as much as we enjoyed playing it. It just wasn't going over. So that's that's kind of the way the litmus test, you know. You put a song in, you play it. If the audience reacts well, you leave it in. If they don't, you dump it, you know, because the, the bottom line is is that, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to entertain the, you know, 14,000 people that show up. So that's, uh, that's, that's how it goes. So... It's as much a question of reading the crowd and entertainment as it is the preferences of the band? Yeah, I think so, because, you know, you don't want to force feed the audience something that they don't really want to hear. Um, and that, that's, that's always been sort of the catch-22 with Chicago. Um, the band has more hits than we can even play in a, in a concert. Um, so to, to actually get to, you know, album cuts, B sides, um, that kind of stuff is, is kind of difficult. And, and some of the, the diehard fans cry foul that we don't do more of that. But, you know, the bottom line is, is that that (laughs) this is a, it is a business and we have to give the crowd what they want, you know? And, um, so that's, you know, there are bands that go out that only have a handful of hits and they have to play songs that maybe the audience isn't familiar with. Um, and we have the opposite problem, too many hits and not enough time to play all of them. You know, when you can, when you can say, Oh yeah, you know, um, we're not doing "Wishing You Were Here," "Stay the Night," "Along Comes a Woman," "Love Me Tomorrow," uh, you know, all which were top forty hits, um, because we don't have time for them. You know, it's kind of um, it's quality problems. Yeah, I mean, on that note, is are there any songs from the ridiculously large back catalog that Chicago has that? you'd like to play but perhaps but haven't been able to for whatever reason hey you know what i grew up a 
a, a huge fan of this band. I know every song from every record, and I would love to play all of them. You know, um, there's there's tons of of uh, matter of fact. I tried to spearhead a basically a one-off performance of nothing but the album cuts, you know, uh, State of the Union and uh, Sing a Mean Tune Kid and, you know, some of the more um, proggy, jazz-inflected stuff from the 70s. And it really, it, it, it became too much of an undertaking to, to, you know, learn it all, rehearse it all, perform it all. I mean, a lot of, a lot of fans have this misconception that, that the band is already, you know, that if you recorded a song that you can still perform it live. But the truth is, you know, all of that material has been long forgotten by the original guys and the new guys have never performed it. So it's like, if you're going to add some of those songs, you, you really have to rehearse it and prepare and, and, um, you know, kind of like we were speaking before we uh, got on the air, um, you know, these guys in the seventies, I mean, they were, it was record, tour, record, tour. They didn't look back and listen to anything they did, you know, for the most part. Um, you know, there are songs that I might mention to the original guys where they go like, Oh yeah, what what record was that on? I, I don't remember that one. You know, <laughs> it's like wait a minute, you recorded it, you don't remember it, but I do. But I was a fan, so I was listening to the records. They were busy working. You know. So I mean, something like "Sing a Mean Tune, Kid" or "Loneliness Is Just a Word" get a little bit left by the wayside in live performances. Oh yeah, yep. Yeah. You know, I would love to do uh, Sing a Mean Tune Kid. That's a great tune. It's actually one of my favorite uh, Peter Cetera vocals um, just because of the the more kind of aggressive R&B nature of it. Um, he really was, you know, I mean, that, that's an amazing, amazing vocal for sure. And also, just a note to the listeners, I'm taking notes of all the songs we're talking about. They are going to be linked to in the description or comment section, whichever is easiest for us. Okay. So, so everyone's... Well, you know... Go oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, uh, your, your audience is primarily a college college age demographic. Is that, that correct? Um, yeah, largely, though some of our... Some of the people in our studio have a really wide audience we've got this one folk rock show that's just wonderful i see because because one thing i would say and, and and this is always the case with chicago when you say chicago to people they generally think the 80s david foster ballad era of stuff or they might remember saturday in the park or 25 or 6 to 4 and it seems to me that one comment I always hear after people see us live is, oh, my God, I had no idea that you guys rock as hard as you do, that there's as much energy. And because people think Chicago love songs, Chicago ballads. But really what this band was founded on was on a more experimental jazz, jam, rock inflected um, thing. It really wasn't until the tenth album when they put out "If You Leave Me Now" that the ballad thing sort of took over. So I would invite the listeners to go back and to dig into some of those early records: CTA, Chicago Two, Chicago Five, um, and, and and really hear. I mean, Chicago was one of the original jam bands. They really were. I mean, speaking of Chicago, too, British producer Stephen Wilson actually just released a remastered version of that, or, well, remixed. Um, what are your thoughts on his edition, would you call it? You know what? I'm just going to be honest with you right now. I haven't heard it yet. I have a copy of it in my wardrobe case. 
<clears throat> and I have not yet been able to uh, sit down and listen to it, or, well, not been able to. I just, just haven't gotten around to it yet. So I'm curious to hear that because <clears throat> everything I've heard and everything I've read is that people say it's it's really amazing that he was able to bring some elements out in the in the music that you almost didn't hear in the original uh, mixes in the recording. <clears throat> but but my personal experience with anything that has been remixed, not remastered, but remixed, has always been problematic to me. And I'm not saying um, that, that this isn't a great thing, because I, I've heard it's great. And a lot of the fans have really dug it. But, like, just as an example, um, I was a big Kansas fan. And I remember they released, uh, I don't know if it was a Greatest Hits or, or what it was, but there was sort of a remixed version of Carry On Wayward Son, where they added tons of reverb to the snare drum. <laughs> and on the original recording, it was bone dry. So you've got the opening of the song, doom, 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 blah, ba, na, 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 right? And all of a sudden it's doom, 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 with all this reverb. And I, it bothered me because that's not what I grew up knowing as the song. Because the mix becomes, you know, what, what you're used to hearing. It becomes the song even if there's flaws in it. So I don't know, it's kind of weird. When, when you get something in your DNA and you're used to hearing it a certain way and then it's different, um, it could be a cool thing, but it could also be a strange thing, if that makes any sense. Oh, it absolutely does. And so I take it that you value rather highly the original artist's and engineer's intentions in a record? Oh, God, yes. I mean, it's funny because I, I was just speaking with somebody about this the other day. You know, um, well, actually, was it you and I was talking about Asia? Yes, Healy it Dan? was. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's like, that was the gold standard pinnacle of audio recording, engineering. Um, just to me, that's just like a flawless recording. and And you would think that it would have just continued to get better from there. But, you know, that was the end of an era of, you know, half a million dollar budget to go into a major studio um, track with unbelievable microphones, unbelievable mic preamps, Neve console, two inch tape, great engineers, um, and then spend months you know, getting it right and mixed and mastered. You know, now everything's done in the computer, in the box, and it's it's uh, everything's done more quickly. Everything is, you know, get a get a a reasonable performance and then fix it, tune it, straighten it out, beat detective it, squash it until it has no dynamics left, and then throw it out there. And you know. There's something to be said for the the human soul of the imperfections of the records that were made in the 70s. They're not perfect, and there are things on those records that if they were made today, they would be fixed. They shouldn't be fixed. You know, that those were the days of play it until you get a performance that's great, even if it has imperfections and commit to it, and then leave it alone. And and that's, you know, one of my favorite examples of that is, uh, I want to say, is it, I think it's Maggie May by Rod Stewart. Um, and I believe Ronnie Wood played bass on it. And there are mistakes all the way through it. It sounded like he didn't even quite know the song yet. And, but it's killer. There's something about it that is so raw and so beautiful, um, 
even when he's hitting clams, that no way would that ever make on, make it onto a record now. No way would they would they allow that to go out there. And that that is kind of the lost art of, of recording to me. Is is really capturing really essentially a live performance in the studio and then letting people hear it. That's why nowadays when you go see a band that you own a record from, they rarely sound live like they do on their record. Because back in those days, you were just bringing the band into the studio with the equipment that they play live on stage, capturing it on a recording and releasing it. Then you go see them live and they sound exactly the same because it's the same amps, same guitars, same people, same performance, essentially. So are you hearing anybody who's uh, breaking or attempting to break this troubled trend currently? You know what? There is a resurgence of, of more organic uh, approach to recording and live performance. Um, I can't really name any real specific examples, but I'm just seeing a lot more, you know, just casually like watching Saturday Night Live and all of a sudden you see a band come on you see Marshalls and SVTs and old Ludwig drum kits and, you know, people kind of going after a more um, organic approach. And I think that's great. Um, my my two daughters uh, are big fans of a band called Panic at the Disco and um, went and saw them live. And I was really, really impressed with Number one, the musicianship, the live performance. Um, uh, Brandon Urie is an incredible singer. But they also did, um, they played Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. And, you know, via social media, all the fans of the band have seen them do this song. And it was a really, really cool moment for me to sit there and watch a bunch of 15 and 16 year old girls singing along and going crazy over Bohemian Rhapsody. It was like, um, matter of fact, I, we went backstage after the show and I got to tell Brendan Yuri how much I appreciated him, you know, being a young man, tipping his hat to his influences and, and turning a younger generation on to it, you know? So, yeah, there's there, there are some, there are some bands out there that are, that are bucking the trend. Um, I think I think this you know this generation now is starting to tire of the sort of cookie cutter prepackaged um, perfect stuff, and and we're actually seeing evidence of that in our audience. You know, it's always cool to see you know teenagers with their parents at a Chicago Doobie Brothers concert you know, wearing ACDC t-shirts, <laughs> you know? I mean, a, a question that's probably far beyond the scope of this interview is, what happened in the middle there? What happened in the middle? Yes, but between the 70s, which you consider the golden age, and the current resurgence of more organic approach, I mean, there was a there was a very notable shift in engineering techniques and in performance techniques, and we're still seeing a lot of that today. Well, you know, <clears throat> when the digital technology came out, you know, and everybody, I, I don't know if you've ever seen the uh, documentary Sound City, but uh, Sound City was a recording studio in L.A. that, uh, you know, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers and Pat Benatar and Rick Springfield and all these uh, great artists coming out, um, uh, Fleetwood Mac, I think, recorded there. And it was just this dingy, funky studio, you know, um, but all analog and just had a great sounding room, great drum sounds, all those Tom Petty records, all the drum sounds. That, that sound city. And when digital technology came out, it basically put the studio out of business because people just automatically assumed that digital was better. And then you had the advent of drum machines and then suddenly auto tune beat detective. And all of a sudden 
you know, like we were talking about, right, the halftime shuffle on Rosanna. If that song had been recorded in Nashville today, they would have they would have pulled it up in Pro Tools and put Beat Detective on it and straightened it out, right? Killing the feel of Jeff Porcaro. And that's that's not what you want to do. You know, this this idea that we can make it better is actually, um, you know, erroneous. And, you know, uh, another perfect example is ZZ Top, right? When, when the Eliminator mm-hmm. record came out, Sharp Dressed Man and all that stuff. That was when Billy Gibbons discovered the Synclavier, which was a sampler that he was able to program drums and bass and and granted those were huge hit records and and they were great records but i'll take lagrange and jesus just left chicago any day over that stuff to listen back now to me the 80s stuff sounds dated the 70s stuff sounds fresh and and i think even even the studio musicians in the 80s started trying to emulate drum machines because that's what that's what people wanted. They wanted perfect. And now I think people are seeing that the perfect stuff doesn't have the longevity. It's the imperfect stuff that actually still holds up. It's Fleetwood Mac rumors. It's the early Chicago stuff. It's those Doobie Brothers records. That's why those bands are still on the road playing to huge crowds because that music is timeless. And, I mean, just on Jeff Porcaro, just Jeff Porcaro himself, I'm not sure there's been a better drummer who's ever lived. No, he's, he's, uh, Jeff Porcaro, <clears throat> Steve Gadd, and Mickey Curry are my three favorites. Well, I mean, there's, there, there's tons more, um, you know, um, Rick Morata and, and uh, Dennis Chambers and uh, Tris and Bowden, our drummer, phenomenal. Oh yes. Um, there's 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 tons of them out there, but uh, Jeff touched me in a way that no other drummer ever has. There's just something so magical and um, consuming about his feel and his groove. Um, I can listen to I can listen to anything he's played on over and over again it's just uh you know Lido shuffle by boss gags comes on the radio and i still just i want it to just go on forever <laughs> because it feels that good wow yeah and actually you know and jeff himself has said in, in interviews <clears throat> you know his halftime shuffle was a, a a bernard purdy thing and if you go back and listen to uh uh some of the Steely Dan stuff Bernard Purdy played on, you can hear it. I mean, that's where that's where Jeff got it from. Um, I think Babylon is Babylon Sisters Bernard Purdy. I think it is. I'm pretty sure that it is. And that's a pretty. That, I mean, that his feel is just unbelievable. Probably, prob, probably his halftime shelf is as good or better than Jeff's. I mean, there are only really three halftime shuffles. There's there are those two, and then there's Bonham's shuffle from Fool in the Rain. Yep, and Jeff admittedly said the Rosanna groove was a combination of Bernard and John Bonham. And a lot of people don't realize that about John Bonham. Everybody thinks of John Bonham as this big, blustery, overbearing, hard-hitting drummer. But he had a finesse. And his hands, I mean, the inside stuff that he did, you know, all the grace notes and all the, uh, you know, he wasn't, his sound was huge, but he wasn't a basher. There was a lot more finesse in his playing than a lot of people realize. And a a perfect example of that, and, and I think you can find it on YouTube, the isolated drum track from Fool in the Rain, which is that halftime shuffle, is just, it's unbelievable to listen to and and he's so consistent and precise with it <clears throat> and it's hilarious too because when he goes for a drum fill you can actually hear him groaning 
uh, you know, into the overhead mics. He's sort of, you can hear him kind of go, ah, as he does a drum fill, which is really, really cool. I've, I've listened to that specific video innumerable times. I'm also going to link to that. Um, and Parcaro's Halftime Shuffle is also isolated on YouTube. Oh, I know. I've heard isolated tracks of the uh, of the vocals on that. Um, I've heard Lukather's guitar is isolated. You know, we haven't even gotten into Steve. He's he's probably one of my biggest influences, Steve Lukather. Um, just everything about him, I, I just I, I just admire his his tone, his feel, his melodic sense his ability to shred when he wants to shred um you know that's what i always kind of aspired to be i fell short but i aspired to it <laughs> um wow i'm not even sure what question to follow that up with well you know you know i grew up obviously um a huge fan of Chicago and Terry Cat. So that's in my DNA. Um, but then in the eighties, I got really, really into both Steve Lukather and Michael Landau and, and what they were doing or in specifically they were on Chicago records. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, but Toto was a huge influence and, and, and also, you know, all the stuff Landau did in the studio. So <clears throat> when I auditioned for, the Chicago gig back in 1995, you know, we were, we were, I, I played six songs with the band and those included 25 or six to four, make me smile Saturday in the park. Uh, and then a couple of the foster ballads, hard habit to break and you're the inspiration. And I was actually able to sort of plug myself into both styles effectively because I was influenced by both styles. So I had the eighties Luke and Landau sounds and, and styles in my, in my playing, but I also had the seventies Terry Cap R and B inflected stuff. So I was able to kind of top both eras. And I think that's part of the reason why I wound up getting the gig because I think there were other guys that came in and they did one or the other really well, but didn't do the, you, you know what I mean? They, mm -hmm. they were like great at the seventies thing, but didn't quite have the eighties thing or they were great at the eighties thing, but on the seventies stuff, they sounded more like eighties. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so somehow I think that worked to my advantage that my influences were sort of diverse enough. Plus I could sing. Kind of. That always helps. <laughs> I, exactly. Really off the wall question: Have you heard the isolated track to Terry Cass guitar solo in Twenty Five or Six to Four? I have, and and what's funny about that is is I wish that had been around when we did a we did a record in Nashville a number of years back called the Nashville Sessions, and it really wasn't originally intended to be a record. It was intended as a, <clears throat> a recreation of, of all the original hit songs of the band to be as faithful to the original as possible, but to be fully owned by the band so that if there was licensing opportunities, the band could, could, uh, you know, give these, these, uh, these newer versions of them so that they would have full ownership of them and, and, and the record company wouldn't get a piece of it basically is kind of what it was. But, but, um, and a lot of bands have done that journey did it. And, but, um, they did wind up releasing it just as kind of a, a novelty thing. And, um, you know, we, we did a really good job of recreating these things, but I had to recreate the exact guitar solo of 25 or six to four. And I had to go in and, and get the original recording and basically kind of try to EQ it to a way that I could hear the guitar solo as clearly as possible. And I learned it note for note. And that was quite an undertaking. Not because physically it's difficult to play, but just because if you're really trying to emulate note for note another musician's uh, solo, you know, it's, 
you know, I can be me all day long, but if you want me to be somebody else, it's difficult. So it, it was an undertaking, but man, I wish that isolated one was available to me because it would have been a lot easier to learn it. But, um, yeah, I even, you know, I even cop the tone, everything. And, and I'm not ashamed to say that I did, I, I did quite a bit of punching in <laughs> to get it. It wasn't a linear performance. I was like four bars at a time, you know, and as soon as I learned it and played it, I couldn't play it ever again. You know, it was, it was gone. And I mean, you've termed that one of the legendary long guitar solos. Oh yeah. I mean, that's gotta be, that's gotta be up there with, you know, Jimmy Page's solo on stairway to heaven, um, free bird, um, you know, all the, all the, you know, that's, that's a classic, um, you know, and I'm sure it was Terry's like, you know, one take off the cuff ad libbed solo and it just became iconic. He had so he had so many solos or ridiculously good solos on that album in the country would be an example that I'd bring up. Oh yeah. I mean <clears throat> he on those first two records alone and it blows my mind when I think about how young he was, because I always, I always think of him as being like older than me, because when I was a kid and I was a fan, you know, he seemed like he was this older, old soul. But I mean, Terry was what thirty when he passed away, you know, and and when he made those records, he was probably twenty one or twenty two years old. And when I think back on what I sounded like when I was twenty one. Uh, I was not ready for prime time at 21 and he, you know, I mean, he, and, and also you, you get the perspective of realizing that you know, that was like 1967, 68, 70, uh, when, you know, that was, that was groundbreaking stuff. You know, you had Jimi Hendrix as obviously a huge influence there in his playing. You can hear it. Um, and, and Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck and, you know, a few others. But had Terry Kath been in a power trio um, where it was, where he was not mixed in with the, the horns and the songs and the, uh, he would be much, much more highly regarded in, in, in the, the guitar world. Um, you know, he's, he's, you know, well respected by every guitar player that I know thinks the world of him, but, but in the public at large, he's not, not the household name of Jimi Hendrix, Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck. And he should be. Oh, absolutely. So how does he influence your playing? I mean, you're playing some of his songs. Well, you know what? And, and this is what I tell people too. Um, even I was sort of, uh, you know, I was more influenced by, by Jeff Beck and Eddie Van Halen and Steve Lukather and, and God, even Ted Nugent and Carlos Santana. But I was such a fan of Chicago and my brother was as well <clears throat> that <clears throat> even though I didn't really dig into Terry's playing like I did some of the other guys. The other guys, I actually went and pulled things off record and tried to learn what they were playing and figure out what the licks were that they were playing. But Terry had this sort of reckless abandon in the, in the way that he played that was such a beautiful thing. It was almost hard to emulate. But the spirit of his playing and the the influence of it um you know, it, it's just in my DNA from just listening to him for so long. So when I approached this gig, um, it was like kind of hard to explain, but, you know, another musician who would have gotten this, this gig, who maybe wasn't as big of a fan of the music, who maybe knew the hits from the radio but didn't really just live it, would have had a harder time kind of gluing themselves into the gig. 
but it was so in my DNA that it was relatively easy to get it under my hands, you know, even though really I hadn't ever really done that. And so, you know, people will say, wow, you really honor what Terry did with the band by the way you play these songs. And it's like, well, I can't really imagine playing them any other way because that's the way I hear it. You know, in my solos, I'm me. But the way I approach, like, the rhythm guitar parts of a lot of the stuff, you know, I I can't really modify any of that stuff. I mean, a little bit, but it's it's so a part of the music that, you know, I can't touch it without feeling like it's a some type of sacrilege. Absolutely. Um, actually... Different question. Are you hearing any younger guys who you particularly like the style of? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's funny you say younger guys. Some of the guys that I think of as younger um, have been around forever. Um, we were talking about that the other day. Like, I still think of like a new band as being like, you know, John Mayer or uh, U2. Those are like new bands. Right, they've been around forever. Um, wow, that's a good question. I mean, you know, in, in the jazz world, certainly, uh, there's a guy named Oz Noy who is just incredible. He's uh, out of New York, and he's been around a while, but he's he's a phenomenal player. Um, you know, gosh, you know what? I, I, I can't say that I can really pull up any new guitar players that are really setting me on my ear, but I'm sure they're out there. I mean, from my perspective, we're seeing this really strange surge of ridiculously gifted musicians that I'm not sure was really recorded in any time prior. Yeah, well, okay, Here, no, here's a perfect example. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with, and you might want to put a link to this for your listeners, but um, Snarky Puppy, are you familiar with those guys? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, that That is some absolutely old-school, mind-blowing, organic groove. I mean, those guys are, and they're young guys, and that stuff is just unbelievable matter of fact we we have apple tv on the bus and we one one day drive into a gig we just put up nothing but snarky puppy videos and just sat there just mind blown um at how good those guys are and uh another another on a, on a little bit different different level is the uh oh gosh what's the name of that band the, the swedish guys the trio uh, uh the aristocrats no um, they're like crazy, crazy technical players, Swedish. Um, shoot, I'll think of it. We'll, we'll, we'll get to it. But, uh, that, that's another one that's, uh, you know, just like mind blowing technical playing. Um, and you know, in, in the jazz world, there's always, there's always going to be that, you know, the Dave Weckles of the world and the, uh, you know, it's just stuff that just makes you laugh. It's like watching a incredible gymnast. You know, you're just going, how is that physically possible, what they're doing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> but uh, but that's a that's a whole different art form of, of you know, it's generally, you know, over the head of uh, the average listener. You know, a great example of that is... Uh, Alan Holdsworth, rest in peace, who passed away. He was so uh, sort of over the top gifted in in being so musically outside of the box that he really only only appealed to musicians. The general public just could not comprehend what was going on there, you know. Even musicians sometimes would get lost with his music, but uh, just incredible, incredible, incredible stuff. 
I actually haven't heard anything from him. I'm going to have to look him up now. Oh, my God. If you want to hear the stuff that's probably the most uh, accessible, um, there's a record called Metal Fatigue by Alan Holdsworth that's probably, you know, <laughs> the most uh, accessible to to an average listener. And I'm not saying you're an average listener. I'm just saying that was his attempt to be somewhat commercial, but it's still <laughs> way outside. And what would you term your favorite of his? Uh, probably that record. And the one right before it called IOU was another great one. And he was also in, um, he played guitar on the Tony Williams Lifetime stuff. Um, there's a song called Fred that's just got, just his matter of fact Eddie Van Halen became hugely influenced by Alan Holdsworth in the in the early 80s and if you listen to his playing on the record on uh, 1984 um, some of the more legato kind of outside sounding stuff that that was him attempting to emulate Alan Holdsworth and, and as a matter of fact the metal fatigue record was largely uh, due to Eddie Van Halen's involvement in trying to get Alan heard by the world because he was so obsessed with him. He wanted to, you know, he wanted more people to know about him. And um, so that, that record, I think he's kind of credited as like an executive producer or something on it. Wow, that, that's a set of connections that I didn't know existed. Oh, yeah. I think they even played together on a couple things. Uh, there may even be YouTubes or some of that, but um, I'll tell you what was one of the most, uh, and this is just kind of off topic, but now that we're talking about Eddie and what a huge influence he was on me, um, one of the coolest things I ever saw in my entire life was um, at the Baked Potato, which is a little jazz club in North Hollywood, seats about 50 people, packed, right? No windows, all wood, amazing sounding room. Um, in the late 80s, when I was living in L.A., you could go there every Sunday night if you went. It was either Jeff Ricaro or Carlos Vega on drums. It was either Greg Matheson or, or uh, David Garfield on keyboards. It was either Michael Landau or Steve Lukather on guitar. Lenny Castro or Luis Conte on percussion, uh, Jimmy Johnson or John Pena on bass. <clears throat> and these were just magical nights. Um, uh, one of the bands was called Los Lobotomies, which was Lukather's thing with David Garfield. And, and, and usually Brandon Fields would be playing sax. And to sit in that room and watch Jeff Picaro do his thing and watch Steve Lukather do his thing in that little tiny little club was just mind blowing. But the night I'm talking about, I heard through the grapevine that Eddie Van Halen was going to be sitting in with both Steve Lukather and Michael Landau and Jeff Percaro and Jimmy Johnson and all these incredible musicians, but all three guitar players playing together. And I went down there at about four o'clock in the afternoon, got in the line, stood there for like four hours to get into that club. And to sit there and watch them blow through like, you know, Red House and um, old Cream tunes, trading solos with Eddie Van Halen. And he had on his like red striped jumpsuit that he wore on the big stage with Van Halen. I mean, it was it was unbelievable. And then they took a break. And I think Eddie had a little bit too much to drink during the break. And he decided not to play during the second set. And he sat down on the floor with his legs crossed like a little kid and just watched Luke and Landau play like awestruck. And that really said a lot to me. Um, as a matter of fact, there's a great story. I think Eddie Van Halen was on Jay Leno. And Jay Leno said to him, what, what's it like to be the, the greatest guitar player in the world? And he said, I don't know. Ask Steve Lukather. 
which was which was really you know you know, the humility was was just was great, and and to see him watch those guys play like in wonder, just blew my mind. It was really 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 a cool night. I that club in general sounds stunning. I mean, the lineup every Sunday. Oh yeah, and it, and they, you know it it even before that, before I got to L.A., you know, Larry Carlton was playing there constantly and uh, Steve Gadd would be in there and you know it's just and it's still a hotbed of, of great great live music matter of fact uh, Tris and I uh, we released a record called the Howland and Bowden Project which was like our little fusion uh, fusion record it came out like I think around 2000 and we did a, a live gig there at the Baked Potato and recorded it and um, it was really a, a pinch me moment for me to play that little club that I'd seen such great performances in a little nerve wracking, to be honest with you. <laughs> oh, and I remember the name of the band I was talking about dirty loops. Actually, I, I've heard of them. Have you, have you checked them out? Yeah, yes, I have. They, I mean, I've seen them do equal parts, covers of pop music and their own music. It's, I'm yeah, not the, even... what? The first thing I saw of them was them covering a Justin Bieber song, and it was like I think it was "Baby," and it was like insane. The drummer, in particular, and the bass player is ridiculous. But <clears throat> I think my favorite track of theirs off their uh, uh, record they released, which I think David Foster had a hand in, um, is a song called "The Way She Walks." that's just it makes me giggle when i listen to it it's so ridiculous on, on every level musically and the guy the singer is like stupid i mean if i recall correctly that guy can belt out he's got in the sand ranch oh yeah it's some of the stuff on the record that, that, you know, my only criticism of the record is it's almost too perfect. It sounds like they, they, you know, really, really, um, that's why the song, the way she walks is my favorite on the record because it almost sounded like they were trying a little too hard to be kind of dancey pop instead of more jazz like what they originally came out being um, to try to, again, appeal to a wider audience. But, you know, I tried to play it for my kids and, you know, it was too, too much. They, they couldn't get it. There was too much overplaying going on for them to, to like it from that perspective. You know what I mean? So again, it really appealed more to musicians than to the general public. But if you just want to hear like ridiculous virtuoso playing, that they're they're it. I'm I'm definitely putting that up for listeners as well. And I mean, on Snarky Puppy, I just in my opinion, Corey Henry's solo on Lingus, released from We Like It Here, if I recall, that just it's one of the greatest keyboard solos ever played. Oh yeah. And the, and I think we like it here, isn't that isn't there like a YouTube of all those performances? Yes, there is, and I've watched most of them. <laughs> yeah, because there's, uh, I mean, again, I've never seen that many musicians playing together and doing it so tastefully, and nobody stepping on each other, but yet virtuoso playing on on every level amazing feel the compositions are just you know the the i forget the guy's name the bass player who, who writes Lee. all this stuff yeah i mean the guy's a genius he's absolutely a bona fide genius that stuff is otherworldly and uh and you know what's great about it too is they're actually they are able to go out and sell out pretty good sized venues um, and, and what they've done with the way they 
record their music. Um, you know, I think in, in, even in those videos, everybody's kind of sitting amongst the musicians with headphones on. So they're actually getting to be a part of the recording and actually experience it in the room. I mean, that must just be phenomenal for a fan to experience that. They, they really, really have a great, a great concept and a great thing going. Yes, and I mean, something that's stunning to me is, it, as, as you said, these are virtuosic musicians, and in this day and age, they're selling out massive venues. Um, I'm in the, I live in the D.C. area. They sold out some huge jazz club two nights in a row, like two years ago. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's a club in uh, Nashville uh, called City Winery, which is a pretty good-sized place, and Snarky Puppy came and played there, and, and I tried to get tickets. I couldn't get in. They were sold out. It was uh, I was really, really disappointed. I thought, oh, well, you know, I can wait till the last minute and probably grab a ticket and go to the show. And uh-uh. <laughs> they were sold clean. Of course, Nashville is full of musicians, so, you know, they're, they're, I'm sure the audience was full of heavy hitters going to check it out. Have you gotten to see them live? I mean, you're, isn't Chicago on tour for most of the year? <laughs> yeah, that's that's one of the big downsides to being part of a, a great touring band is, is that you, you, you don't really get a chance to go see many uh, shows by other bands. The only time I get to see other bands is when we're on tour with them. <laughs> but uh, I did, however, get to see... Uh, uh, my wife and I went and saw the Tears for Fears Hall and Oats tour uh, when they came through town, and uh, I did get to see Toto um, on a night off. That was actually uh, <clears throat> me and Jeff Coffey, our new uh, lead singer, who's a huge Toto fan as well, um, rented the car and drove like three hours um, on a night off up to see um, Toto, I think, in Milwaukee. I think we were in Chicago, had a night off, and went up, and that, so we got to hang out with those guys, and it was that was really fun. I got to introduce Jeff to Lukather, which one of his heroes, and so that was really kind of a cool, a cool moment. And and by the way, speaking of Jeff Coffey, um, I don't know if the listeners know this, but he he came into the band j just over a year ago, replaced uh, Jason Sheff, who um, who kind of took a leave of absence and then decided to sort of. Um, retire essentially he's been with the band for 30 years and but jeff is just uh just an unbelievable tenor vocalist and 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 killer bass player and the band is just better than ever in my opinion and that's no res disrespect to jason it's just that there's a there's a because he's so fired up and and new and excited and there's just a new energy and chemistry and the band is just kicking right now. Oh, wait, was it was it he, him, or Jason on the Earth, Wind, and Fire tour last year? Depends on which leg of the Earth, Wind, and Fire tour you saw. If it was the spring edition, it was Jason. If it was the fall, it was Jeff. So I'm not sure when you saw when you saw it. Uh, I was I was at the one in Virginia. Hmm. Was that in the spring? Uh, I think that was in the summer, so it probably would have been Jason. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Yeah, Jeff. Jeff's hard to miss. He looks exactly like Owen Wilson. So. Uh, well, I guess that me and any other listeners out there have an excuse to go see Chicago, like we needed any. <laughs> you know, we're we're. It's it's really interesting because uh, I, I think because of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the documentary that was on CNN, um, and and Jeff coming into the picture, we're we're seeing like a real sort of a lot of people coming to the meet and greet saying, uh, I haven't seen you guys for twenty five years, I haven't seen you for twenty years. Last time I saw you was in seventy seven, you know that are. You know, maybe through social media, you know, the word's getting out that the band is really, really representing well, and people are coming out 
to check it out. You know? So I would encourage everyone to come see us. Now, you say you're in the D.C. area? Yeah, I am. Okay. I thought this was for a Boston radio station. Um, actually, I go I go to school up in Boston, and this is for a Boston radio station, but I'm, I live down here. I'm interning down here, so just oh, okay. doing a remote interview. Are you, uh... Uh, are you going to Berkeley? Um, actually, Brandeis. Okay. All right. Cool. I, I wish I was good enough to get into Berkeley. <laughs> Man, if I, if I could do it all over again, uh, you know, when I wasn't so busy working, I would have loved to have gone to Berkeley. Um, that, that, you know, I wish I would have thought of that back in, you know, when I was 20 years old or whatever, I would have gone to Berkeley, but, uh. I guess I did okay. <laughs> it's a wonderful place. We've actually hosted some performers from there, and they're they're stunning. They they oh. even do audio engineering better than anybody else on my campus. Oh, absolutely. Yep. Yep. Well, you know, Ber Berkeley's the gold standard music school. You know, not that not the dis. I, I went to GIT in in Hollywood. You know, one year deal out there and, and, and that was a good program but uh you know berkeley's berkeley is the real deal yeah and i mean there are stunning composers coming out of there out of eastman oh yeah yeah is uh well and then also uh what is it north texas they also have great great uh music program down there Actually, an old section leader of mine, a percussionist, uh, went down there for school. He he was basically the best drummer I'd ever been that close to. Out of uh, North Texas State? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Our sax, uh, saxophone uh, player, uh, Ray Herman, went there. And uh, he's, he's an incredible musician. He's, uh, he's, he's quite... Uh, I'm always knocked out when he solos he never plays the same thing twice which i wish i could say that but <laughs> but uh he's yeah i get into i get into ruts uh sometimes you find things that work and you stick with them but um not ray he's he gets bored if he plays the same thing twice wow there's a great there's a great story about miles davis apparently um I can't remember who the guitar player was, but uh, it might might have been Mike Stern or John Schofield was playing with Miles, and you know it was like the second night of the tour, and and he was taking a solo and he was playing some of the same stuff he played the night before, and Miles just kind of came over to him and said into his ear on stage, said, "I already heard that." <laughs> it was like <laughs> it was like, "Hey, I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear any anything the same." I want to hear different stuff every night, which that's tough, you know. But uh, so I wouldn't be a good candidate for the Miles Davis gig. I got about three licks and I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I could teach them to you if you want. <laughs> but um, anyway, I, so yeah, we, we actually just hit an hour. <laughs> That's all right. That that that's pretty good for a fifteen minute interview. Absolutely. I hope I hope people are still listening. Uh, at the end oh, of an hour. Too. But um Well cool. Well maybe we should wrap it up. That's probably enough enough of my yakking. I but um, I think that would be wise. Thank you so much for coming on the show. No worries. I hope uh hope some folks come out and Check us out. Um, where are we playing, by the way? Are we playing uh, in at Harbor Lights? The old Harbor Lights in Boston? Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm, at, I'm actually looking that up right now. Pretty sure it is. They, you know, they call it now. It's like the 